Hello, I'm Deborah Francis White, and I'm here for the British Museum. Now, this panel is in conjunction with the city exhibition Feminine Power The Divine to the Demonic. And here today, I have two divine and extraordinary human beings, both feminine. The incredible Laura Bates, best known as the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project, uh, but uh, also with uh, many books out, the most recent of Fix the System, Not the Women. I approve. Also, we're here with Dr. Leila Hussein. Uh, Dr. Leila Hussein is a psychotherapist and she, she specializes in supporting survivors of sexual abuse. You may know her from her incredible work, Ending FGM along with the Dahlia Project, which she founded. So today uh, we are going to be talking, inspired by this extremely brilliant exhibition uh, from the Demonic to the Divine, Feminine Power, but about contemporary issues, because we are in an extraordinary time in history. Uh, we've just come through an historic time uh, with COVID, and through that, Women's sexuality, uh, you know, feminist issues have really come to the fore, but often we felt trapped in our houses and we weren't able to do what we normally would have done to push back against those things and we were stuck online. So I would love to throw this open today uh, to Layla and to Laura. Let's kick us off. Um, I, I, the other day, saw a clip of Jay Leno talking to a young child star I think she was the star of uh, Mrs. Doubtfire and she was a child and it was just doing the rounds as sort of something that would happen in the 90s or noughties that Jay Leno was saying to her on his late night TV show, uh, have you got a boyfriend? And she went, oh, no, she looks about eight. And she goes, oh, no, he goes, oh, you hesitated, you have. And she's like, no, 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 I just was hesitating because I've got boys who are friends, but I didn't really you know, know what you meant. And he was really pushing her. And we were all talking about that just as a uh, I think Dorno Porter posted it and said, God, those times, which were so recent and so burned into our minds, uh, really were a time when red rings were around the cellulite of women on the front cover of every magazine. Gail Porter's naked body was projected onto the House of Commons without her permission, without payment, in order to uh, promote a lads mag, which she had agreed to be on the front of. Um, and children were consistently Ooh, heterosexually, have you got a boyfriend sexualized on television? Um, do you feel, let's start positive, we've we've made strides uh, and we've we've have we come a long way? Is there anything positive you could tell us, Laura? I think we've certainly made strides in some ways. I think that we have incredible um, activists to thank for that, civil rights activists, feminist activists who have fought so hard to change things. Um, and of course, we have made progress and that's really important to celebrate. But I also think it's fairly depressing to think how recently, for example, we've seen the deputy leader of the House of Commons accused of crossing and uncrossing her legs in Parliament to distract the Prime Minister. Um, so those days of this kind of obsession with reducing women to their sexuality and focusing on that above all else really doesn't feel like it's changed a great deal at all. Um, I think that era that you were describing had such a formative impact on so many of us growing up during that period. Um, I think things like the tabloids counting down, for example, to the 18th birthdays of celebrities like Emma mm. Watson and Charlotte Church, journalists lying on the floor to try and photograph up her skirt the night that the Olsen she twins, birthday. yeah. And then those women subsequently being blamed while she was wearing a short skirt, so she was asking for it. And with that as well, I think if you look even as recently as looking at the absolute social media storm, for example, around Amber Heard, has anything really changed? Not, not very much. See, I think you're right. So much more needs to change. But also, I interviewed Millie Bobby Brown on my podcast recently, Star of Stranger Things, and she really came of age. She started that show when she was about 12. And she, the thing that she said she wanted for her 18th birthday was to come on The Guilty Feminist and talk about growing up in that spotlight. Um, because she said she'd come to rely on The Guilty Feminist as a way to make sense of that experience. And she became a TV producer so young she's completely taken the power seat. And mm -hmm. she's talked about things that have been said about her in the media and her response to that, and that she felt she could make a response because she had social media. Leila, social media is both a blessing and a curse. 
Um, mm-hmm. How do you feel things have changed? Do you think things would have been different if Gail Porter had had Instagram to reply on? Do you think we're in a better position now that women can put themselves out there and, and uh, it's it's no longer the male gaze and the lads mag? Mm. How do you feel? I think as, as I think as Laura, I agree with what Laura said, even with social media, we actually social media has become a tool we now use to challenge. I mean, now you'd be scared to say such a thing because it can go viral very quickly. But at the same time, that same tool could be used to over-sexualize women and girls. Literally in that, I mean, the revenge porn, you know, it's out of the roof right now. It's something that's constantly used. It's in your face. So it's a great tool, social media, but it's very, it, it's still not monitored in a way, especially where women are protected. And maybe if I add another layer to this, especially where black women feel very unprotected in that space. You know, if I use, for example, um, the R. Kelly case, you know, for many, many years, people were on social media saying these girls are locked up in a house. But the comments is very different to when the Me Too movement happened. There was sympathy. The world came together. And but that same sentiment was um, the case on social media for black women. So for maybe maybe for white women, social media has kind of worked and it's been on their best side. But for black women, that's still a big struggle. I mean, even with my current work around female genital mutilation, I'm still dealing with people tagging me of a girl being cut or mutilated or a woman with a razor just to kind of make a point. So that's not a safe way to use social media. But again, that's sexualized and, and, and it's fetishized. I guess there's a lot of fetishization that also happens in these spaces around women, especially black women. Yeah. If we gave you the feminist magic wand, Layla, <laughs> what would you do? What would you see oh. change? Oh, how long do we have? I, would, I mean, I would absolutely, oh, I would kill the disease called misogyny and patriarchy. I think that's the where this all stems from. You know, people always ask me, do you think violence against women is ever going to end? And sadly, my response is always, it's, we, you know, we're challenging it, but it's very difficult when you have a system that allows for women to be abused. We have a legal system that doesn't protect women. You know, recently I was um, meeting with colleagues in Somalia and Somaliland and they said to me, oh, no, we don't even have a law that protects me from domestic violence or just be- being discriminated against. That's the world we're living in, you know, globally. So so for me, I mean, that's yeah, that's that's if I had a magic wand for me, patriarchy slash misogyny has to that would be the first thing I would try to get around. I mean, so much. But for me, that stems from all these issues women and girls are facing. It's living in that, in, in, in that, I guess, infested space of misogyny and patriarchy. Yeah. And given we don't have a magic wand, Laura, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> what can we do practically? And I sort of want something small and accessible that our audience of viewers today who are watching this in the future can think, yeah, there's some steps I can take. Um, whose job is it? Whose responsibility is it? And who might it fall to if whoever whose responsibility it is doesn't doesn't step up? And what what can we do? Well, it's the responsibility of gatekeepers and people in positions of mm-hmm. power. And of course, those people aren't stepping up. And I think it's really important that we do relocate this conversation about solutions within that perception of a system, just as Layla said, because for so long, we've been asking what women can do, what individual women can do. And of course, what that leads to is the fact that one of the greatest Google searches after Sabina Nessa's death was what was Sabina Nessa wearing? The fact that people um, said that Sarah Everett shouldn't have submitted to the false arrest that was used to imprison her by her murderer. That was a police and crime commissioner who said that, that after Bobby Ann McLeod was murdered, the mayor leader of her local city council said women shouldn't be putting themselves in compromising positions. Mm -hmm. The reality is, as we we all know, that it is not about women's actions or their behaviour or their clothing. It's about a society in which male violence is allowed to run rampant, in part because of these failing systems, a failing legal system, failing police, failing politics. So I guess the The crux of this problem is we can locate the problem within those systems, but then does that leave us feeling disempowered as individuals in terms of how we can influence it? And I think the answer is public 
pressure. We can see this in the way in which politicians, unfortunately, I think, are forced to respond when the public recognises something as a crisis. So I think it's about uniting in collective action to try and push for systemic change. How can somebody listening to this right now do that individually? Really good, very specific example. You could support Rights of Women, which is a brilliant organisation which is currently campaigning for um, a a statutory inquiry into systemic misogyny within Mm. policing. That would be something concrete that we could then point to to move forward and say, actually, uh, this is a real issue uh, that needs to be tackled. So a systemic inquiry into the police force, misogyny? Yes, because of the fact that at the moment we're in a situation where we're told that somebody like Wayne Cousins is a single bad apple, an aberration that nobody could have seen coming against the ridiculous context of the fact that in a four year period recently, 2000 Met police officers alone were accused of sexual misconduct. Mm-hmm. Um, or that, And also the WhatsApp messages we saw that were racist and sexist and homophobic. Absolutely. And the fact that he had a horrible, horrible nickname and uh, yeah. routinely turned up to events with sex workers. And you just go to police events. You know, he is a married man and he's turning up with sex workers to those events. So they knew, they knew what kind of person he was. Yeah. Um, I think people often forget the end of the proverb about bad apples. It's one yeah. bad apple. Spoils the whole barrel. Ruins the whole barrel. Yeah, absolutely. So it's no you use see, saying- But do you see why... He was behaving like that for a very long time because society created an environment where he can do that. Only now that's been questioned. But that's, and to me, that's the real issue. We have created these spaces where people feel that's okay behavior. But then Laura and I and you, Deborah, will question it. We are crazy women who are just moaning and like we are vilified. I had a, you know, like um, when, when working on get women and girls programs, for example, in development. One of the biggest challenges we face as feminists in that space is that we are constantly told, well, if you want to end FGM of violence in women, why don't you fund men too? You must fund men. That's mm. the constant conversation. You're, for, you're literally subjected. Fund, you fund to, men fund men for what? To end you know, violence against women or FGM. So that, that's always what we have to What are to they fund. saying you should fund men for? To stop male yeah. circumcision or what? No, what no, no, it, no, no. It? They're going to help women from ending oh. so they should also and, and it's 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 across the board of in in the development space that i'm seeing over and over again there's a lot of and because the way that's framed again is in order to end violence against women we must get men we have to persuade men now <laughs> do you see how the system is built we have to persuade men in order for us to accept women or not harm women but we have to get the men first and we that's get the, the challenge. Board. We right. have to get men on board. So I should spend right. the funding and my energy to convincing a guy. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm actually smiling. I can't even, I, because I'll start crying if I <laughs> really dig deep into this. But mm. that's the system we are subjected yeah. to all the time. And it seems that if the men who do harm women and, mm. you know, in, in countries certainly where there are a reasonable number of laws, it is a minority of men, of course, hurting women or hurting anybody. Mm. If those mm. men were persuadable, then I feel like they would have been persuaded by now. Um, yeah, I, exactly. I, I feel like <laughs> spending money persuading men who hurt women. I think the men who have to get on board are the men who don't hurt anybody, but also don't want to cause trouble in the pub when women are sexualized and others. Men who don't want to rock the boat in their workplace. Um, Those are the men who need to step up and go, I'm going to start to rock the boat. I am going to stand up. I'm going to say this isn't normal. It's not right. We don't want to live in this society because the thing is we are already the other in this situation. Exactly. Those men who hurt women don't listen to women because they're already already othered. I do think, though, my mental health has got a lot better since me too because whereas in Mm. that era of red circles around Saturday night and, you know, naked women being projected on the, the House of Commons and so forth. Whenever I complained, just like in comedy, for example, I'm a comedian, whenever I would complain in a green room and say, that's not cool, like, you know, something would happen or the man before I would go on would do really horrendous material that was so 
explicit and disgusting <laughs> and degrading about women and sometimes violent. If I would say anything, it would be like, you've got no sense of humor. If you can't mm -hmm. hack it, if you can't mm -hmm. take the heat, get out of the kitchen. Um, and I often had these conversations where I was looked at as slightly risible, like you're asking for special treatment or um, this is normal. But I'd often have those conversations with women who would also say, Mm -hmm. Well, we've got equality now. If you ask for any more, you're asking for a leg up and it's boring. I remember you, women used to say that it's boring. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Sexism is, you know, all this talk about sexism is boring and you need to get on now. You need to be, have a, like a ladette attitude. And I feel now, like if I bring something like that up, because I think something's not okay, that's taken very seriously. If I were to mm -hmm. say, that material is really degrading to women and it's not fair because you've got two women on the bill who have to go on after this guy and they they are now presented as the other. And how has that changed the makeup of the audience? If there are violent men in the audience, they now see this as a space where they are safe and we are not. And that's taken seriously now. And that was never taken seriously before. I was seen as risible when I complained about those things and I always did. I almost always did. And I'd get myself into so much trouble for complaining about it. And I always felt like, oh, my God, I'm the difficult one. I don't feel like that anymore. I don't feel like I'm the difficult one. I feel like we've won the argument, but I don't feel, well, certainly in some spaces I operate in, but I don't feel a significant change in the power structures has taken place. And that's what I'm interested in shifting now. Do you feel any more empowered to speak than you used to or that you'll be taken more seriously or there's more platforms for you to speak on? Nora? Yes, I think there are. I think that's undeniable. And I think that's a testament to the incredible courage and power of the literally millions of women and girls and non-binary folk who have spoken out about their experiences of abuse. And, you know, the really brilliant campaigns from Me Too to Everyone's Invited that have encouraged that. And I think it's so powerful and it, it cannot be I think, overestimated how important that has been in changing the landscape of our perception of the issue, our willingness to listen when women speak out and women's knowledge that, that there are others there for them, that they're not alone, that it wasn't their own fault, that it isn't normal. But in my work, what I see is a really acute dividing line between that improvement, I think, in kind of response and knowledge that it's not OK um, within the adult world and with what young people are experiencing, because within schools, I think girls are still unable to speak out. I think that girls are still feeling ignored, dismissed, disbelieved, slut shamed, victim blamed. And I think we're still not grappling with the reality of a sexual violence crisis not just affecting young people, but specifically happening within our places of education. And yep. I know people always think that sounds like an exaggeration. She's hysterical. She's overreacting. We have the figures. We know from a very recent Ofsted inquiry that 80% of girls say sexual assault is simply normal in their friendship group. It happens so frequently. <sighs> we know they wouldn't dream of reporting it because they don't think of it as sexual assault. It's just normal. We know that on average, if we break down the statistics that five and a half thousand sexual offences, including 600 rapes, happen in schools in a three-year period, one rape every day of the school term is being reported from schools, in schools. That is an epidemic, isn't it? it the, the figures are really shocking, but we just don't want to acknowledge them. Yep. Mm -hmm. really clear figures that almost a third, 29% of teenage girls say they experience unwanted sexual touching at school. Mm -hmm. So girls are yeah. literally being sexually assaulted in their millions at school, not just while they're young, but in their place of education. And I just don't think that Me Too has touched the sides of that. And that isn't a criticism of Me Too. It's a criticism of the public response to Me Too, which yep. should have been to take action, structural action. And instead has been to wring hands and, you know, hold events and speeches and photo calls and then to move on. Mm. Couldn't agree with um, you more. Yep. <laughs> what kind of education programme or structural program should we be having in schools to stop this? Because it's true, I recently had um, a young Guilty Feminist fan on who, you listener, regular listener, she's 13, her name's Amelia, and she comes to so many live shows when we're, she's in Wales and she comes to lots of different shows when we're around the country near Wales, and she's uh, absolutely amazing. But she was talking to us about upskirting at school and uh, other sorts of inappropriate touching and just generally like you say like sexual assault 
and that you know they they wouldn't be believed that it's just what's expected but then she brought it to her teachers and they went oh no okay we can't have this and you know she's changing her school there is something being done about it but how do we because i think it's very difficult as a young girl to i don't know how i would have coped with speaking up about something like that um why do boys feel they can do this feel this is normal feel this is funny feel this is acceptable and why are schools not driving an education program and a zero tolerance policy for this do you think leila any ideas it's what i said earlier it's still it's still the 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 system you know that allows it for it to happen for me especially when when that teachers now responding in such a way is that teachers bias and conditioning that responded in such a way so again it's that system i remember an in, well, a situation I, w- i should not name this school it's a very prestigious school in europe and i was a, a keynote speaker there and i pointed out the policy that particular school had around boys and girls in terms of how they dress and i've been going to the school maybe 3 years in a row i've been invited the moment i started pulling out their own policies because boys were allowed to wear tank tops and booty shorts which you can see all of their legs but girls were not allowed to wear this because and actually the policy said it's for their own safety and I remember one particular student saying to me she was told if you wear this your teacher might come on to you so this is again the environment <laughs> where then when we become adults of course that boy in school now thinks you know he's been told been been a perpetrator is like it's kind of okay actually it started in school where girls have been told it's your fault and boys have been told it's not your fault it's the way she dresses actually we have a policy here that says that that it's got to be her fault if she dresses such a way so for me if we were teaching children and for me when i say teaching children we i'm going back to um, uh, you know nursery we have to teach children to how to protect their bodies around healthy relationship because you know, abuse comes in so many ways you know around uh, healthy relationships and sex maybe i mean this is something i always say you know especially for women and girls they need to be they, they need to learn how to you know children need to learn how to take care of themselves we don't teach about self care and well being we don't teach we don't teach around how do you financially you know look after yourself the, the really key things we need when we leave school we were never taught it that's so <laughs> true it. the key things in life there were just so many different key things in life I that i i didn't know about my bank no statement about. until i got a job but i wish my yeah. school taught me what my bank statement meant what making money meant all the life skills we need we don't have that so for me if we ha- there has to be a radical shift mm. or change i mean actually laura your first book really helped me understand it was the first time i re- realized i had my daughter was uh, i think year 7 in school and you told me we don't even have the clitoris organ on the biology books i mean that's shocking <laughs> mm. like that's crazy like about my body but that's how much society discriminates against me doesn't like my body they don't put it on the biology book that's really one that needs to be addressed mm-hmm. in my opinion yeah how a credit card works and how the clitoris works two things <laughs> let me tell you we all need to learn in school <laughs> boys need to know how the straight boys need to know how the clitoris works bisexual boys need to know how the clitoris works uh, exactly. uh, you know that's important but also just as a basic education so do gay boys you know like we all need to know orgasm there's some so much shame around pleasure, things pleasure. like that pleasure pleasure embarrassment Yeah, and actually yeah. what if we de-shamed it and said you're going to want a normal healthy sex life it's important to know mm. how does this go about i was remember this the wonderful may martin telling me that before her first day at school her mother sat her down and said here's some things that you should know and she said this is how a man and a woman has sex this is how a woman and a woman has sex this is how a man and a man has sex and she just presented mm. them all as if that's totally mm. all absolutely equal and ordinary and then she said also you should know there's no santa claus <gasps> and uh may was only 5 years old and went to school wow. on the first day of school told all the other kids uh about anal and santa love- <laughs> and um unfortunately the other parents complained and um, so did. maybe that was a little bit too much of a radical approach she's told that story on a podcast before of mine so it's it's uh, it's it's in the ether i'm not i'm not speaking out of school but there's something wonderful about that really open approach around well here's all the different ways that this this can happen 
Um, mm. And some of the ways that you can have sex can produce a baby and some can't and some can produce great pleasure and some mm. will more likely produce pleasure for one partner and some can give you an STD and this is how you protect yourself against that. But all of these ways are just ordinary ways that people find pleasure when they're grown ups. And I think that that if we did that, but if we also had a, a real eye for consent, things would be different. Mm-hmm. Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah. The Guilty Feminist presents Camp As Christmas is coming on the 3rd of December at Queen Elizabeth Hall. I'm hosting with Tom Allen. Acts include Sophie Duca, Daniel Fox, Larry Dean, Rosie Jones, Kima Bob, Russell Tovey and Rob Diamond, and many more. It is going to be the night of nights. Everyone on the bill is LGBTQ+, and 100% of our proceeds go to the Say It Loud Club, run for and buy LGBTQ plus refugees. We are back at King's Place live on the 21st of November with our incredible guest, Seiyi Akiwowo. She's written a book on the subject of internet safety and she's here to tell us all about it. Do not miss that night. Uh, the second half of that show will be taken over by the Fuck It Up Comedy Club. That's Kima Bob. And Fuck It Up Fox stands for Femmes of Colour. It's going to be an incredible night. That is also a podcast from the House of the Guilty Feminist. If you could do me a favour right now, Go to wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to or follow uh, the Fuck It Up Comedy Club podcast and the Media Storm podcast. The Media Storm podcast, which is new from the House of the Guilty Feminist. Media Storm was only in their second season. Uh, They've already uh, won a number of awards, including a gold in the British Podcast Awards, and they're now nominated for a British Journalism Award as Best Interviewers. I really, really recommend uh, that you give them a listen because they're interviewing the people asked last, giving voice to the voiceless, and they're doing some very, very interesting journalism. We are also at King's Place on the 14th of December. We'll reveal our guest for that soon. For more information and to book, go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on live shows. To support the podcast and get ad-free episodes, go to patreon.com slash guiltyfeminist. And if you could pop over to iTunes and give us a five-star review, you can review any latest episode. You can review every episode if you want. Uh, we would really appreciate that. would help. If you could tell someone else about The Guilty Feminist, bring someone along to a live show, that would be an enormous help to keep the podcast going and support it. And now back to the podcast. How do you feel about the word consent? Because I rather worry it's in, I think I wrote about this in my book, but it's it's like I'll consent to my neighbour building a fence because I sort of have to and it's it's me being re- reasonable. But that doesn't sound like I want a fence. It sounds like I'm consenting to my neighbour putting it on the edge of my property. I'm not engaged by it. I'm excited about it. I don't want to pay for it. I'm not <laughs> picking out a colour scheme. If I consent... To you, to ramblers walking through my garden, I'm not hoping they will. Do you feel like there's a better word than consent? Well, I think it frames it within the existing context and the existing stereotype, which is of heterosexual, heteronormative sex being something that a man wants all the time. And when a woman gives in, that's when it happens. And that is still how it is framed to young people, I think, which has yeah. huge ramifications down the line, not only in terms of women's sexual pleasure, 91% of men climaxed in their last sexual encounter compared to 64% of heterosexual women. And the number goes up massively for women having in same sex partnerships, for example. But is also that, in is that cisgendered of- women, just to be clear? Yes, that, I think so. I believe so. That's, so. that's straight cisgendered women, because the it is true. I I looked into the stats on this recently, and lesbians are having a great time. Exactly right. So that tells you something. Yep. But also uh, flipping it on its head male survivors of sexual violence who are silenced and stigmatized Mm -hmm. because of this harmful myth that they must have been up for it, that all men want it all the time and that all women are prudes who take no pleasure in sex and simply Mm -hmm. get ground down by and eventually give in, right? It's so incredibly harmful and it's so incredibly small. I think with so much of this, we're thinking too small. There's a great quote from a mum of a girl who I think told her when she was going to school, consent is too low a bar, hold out for enthusiasm, Mm -hmm. uh, which I thought was a good way of putting it. I think we have to think bigger on all of this. When we're talking about 
schools and the problem, we so often reduce it to the curriculum. But we need to be thinking, as Leila said, about school dress codes. We're not just talking about RSE. We're talking about the way that schools are approaching everything. We're talking about um, the entire system in terms of whether schools are partnering with local charities. We're talking about teacher training. We're talking about the fact that there's no national system for recording sexual violence in schools. So we have no Mm -hmm. idea what's going on, really, because we're not even bothering to keep a record of it. And I think that that's the case for so much of this. The bar is so low. Did she agree to it rather than was this a brilliant time for all involved? And I think that's a trick, really. I I think what I find with consent, usually there's a lot of coercion that's involved. So just because even someone might have said I've consented, but does that really mean they've consented? I mean, it's like your example, Deborah Lake. Did you really consent? But you had to kind of consent to keep the peace. I mean, maybe that was your end goal for this. But I know with, with, with the work that we do, we actually, like every, you know, when we're meeting with women and girls who are survivors of FGM, we actually create a space to talk about what consent actually means. You have to explain what consent means. It's not something that you sign in a form. What does it actually, what does it represent? What does, how does it protect you? whether you consent or not. Like, so those conversations need to be had. And again, that's part of the conversations again in school, something we're not taught of. Um, so it, it's it's a wider conversation. I don't think there's an actual word for it that we can change or look at. Maybe we, we, we'll find it somewhere along the line. But for me, there needs to be a space to even understand what consent actually is. Because a lot of people have in theory consented, but when you really unpack that story or the you know why that person consented, you realize there was no consent. There was pressure and being coerced into doing this yeah absolutely and if you are coerced that is not consensual it's not consent it's no longer consent absolutely i i also resist the word enthusiasm because sometimes sex it doesn't look like you're a girl scout going you know like well it shouldn't definitely shouldn't look like you're a girl scout just to be clear uh but you know that kind of yeah rah 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 yay 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 i love sex like sometimes it can be like really like exciting and quiet and sort of like you know it doesn't if someone was looking at your face, they wouldn't go, you know, you feel you can feel very almost like paralyzed in a moment, but you're very engaged. Mm-hmm. And I think there's something around engagement that is interesting to me. Is your partner engaged or are they checked out? Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, also there's a whole world and I mean that that's increasingly not underground anymore, that's overground with all of the sex parties that are happening in London now in the roaring, the new roaring 20s post-COVID, um, and there really are a lot, that's about kink. And kink is often about dominance and submission. And the kink community, interestingly, is a place where there's so much more like pre-existing consent because you have to. You have to say, this is what I like, this is what I don't like, mm-hmm. these are the safe words, this is what you might see on my face if I'm resisting using a safe word because I feel too much in the moment and I don't know how to say the safe. So much has to be laid out. And I have, I've talked to people who've said to me, you know, who go, um, you know, to places like Crossbreed, which is a, a sex party that goes on in London where there's a lot of this kink and uh, very open, very queer, very inclusive, genderqueer. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people who say, oh, I much prefer that world. Because the wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, Tinder, hookup, everyone does it the same, don't they? Heteronormative missionary position is that there's no discussion because it Mm -hmm. seems weird to go, and how do you like to sex? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, how many minutes of foreplay? And it's like, well, it's not really like that. But discussion around what you like, how you like to be touched, how you like to be spoken to, all of those things is is so much more dynamic in the kink community and it doesn't always look like enthusiasm. Yeah, I think we're talking there, aren't we, about a context of communication and a context of of power. And I think there is such a, there's a lack of communication and a power imbalance within that kind of heteronormative, porn-inspired, often an online whole area that we haven't talked about yet tinder kind of culture and i think perhaps that's what we're seeing very differently within some of those other communities where communication is just so much more a part of the whole process and that that immediately restores uh, the balance of power 
to all parties involved. And it is very much about power imbalance, I think, particularly with young people. There is this sense of it being something that has to be done in the way that they've seen online. And what we're seeing online, we've seen some really great research from Durham University recently, Professor Claire McGlynn and others, which found that if you look at the most mainstream, easily accessible porn websites, so you're not talking about specific fetish sites or kink sites, but very much kind of mainstream, the the sort of thing a kid might find if they type in the word porn or sex and click on the first link, then Mm. an eighth of those videos on the front page are showing women being raped, women being coerced, abused, otherwise illegal, illegal sex. So what you see when you're in schools is it is completely normal in schools for me to hear Mm -hmm. of 12 or 13 saying things like rape is a compliment, really. It's not rape if she enjoys it. You hear kids of that age saying, well, you know, I realized until I watched a video a boy showed me on the mobile phone that when you have sex, the woman has to be hurting and crying. Um, I went to a school. Oh, my God. This is horrific. This is very common. This is very common. It's so so common. common. Go into so a couple of schools a week, and I, it's hard to communicate to people how extreme the picture is and how normal it is for them, for the kids. For example, I was in a school where they'd had a rape case involving a 14 year old boy, and a teacher had said to him, Why didn't you stop? And she was crying. And he'd looked straight back at her and said, Because it's normal for girls to cry during sex, because that's what he'd seen online. And I think that's where the communication gap really, really <laughs> doesn't shock me anymore. Because it's I don't think it's about censorship. I don't think it's about stopping online porn. I think it's certainly about changing the culture that's reflected in online porn. But I think more than anything, it's about communication. If we don't talk to kids about sex, when 60% of 14-year-olds have seen online porn and a quarter of 12 or young when they first see it, they are going to assume that what they see online is what sex looks like. And if what they that see is online is misogynistic and... <sighs> horribly shocking to me, Laura. It's horribly, horribly no, shocking. Sorry, I, on. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not a porn person. I don't watch porn. But how do we, I mean, we had someone on the show not long ago who, who's aiming for ethical porn and feminist porn and those kinds of things. Like we can't put the porn genie back in the bottle and arguably in fourth wave feminism, it's not something we want to do because people make their living in that way, that that it can be a healthy expression. Lots of feminists I know watch porn and that's a normal part of their life. I don't know how I feel about it, but I have certainly been, uh, had complaints when I have on the Guilty Feminist podcast, for example, and I think this is going out as bonus content. So if you're listening, uh, I've heard your complaints that if I haven't said enthusiastic warm things about porn. People have said, look, you're sort of sex shaming. Um, How do we then manage pornography so that the artists are protected and treated well, so that normal expressions of what's normal, so that a wide variety of sexual expressions, human sexual expressions can be catered to but that we are not training adolescents and people who have access to the internet before adolescence that violence against women or men or non-binary people is normal or okay. What do we do? Layla, Laura, help me. <laughs> Laura, that might sound like two broken records, but I think it goes back to our education system. I think, again, young women, you know, teenage girls are feeling of, you know, thinking this is okay behavior because we are still in that we are creating these environments where this is okay. Actually, Laura, I'm not sure you hear this. Actually, girls who are not part of these activities are bullied. If you're not part of it, if you stand up for yourself, you're bullied. So there's actually, so now we have environments where girls don't even have a choice but to be part of this. It, it's, it's become some sort of a badge of honor to, in order for you to survive in school. Because, you know, now you don't just get bullied in your school playground. You get bullied in your social media platform. So you don't have a break from the bullies like we used to. You know, we could go home and then not deal with them. But now they are on your phone. Like, unless you shut your phone, then you can't get away from these people. So I can't even imagine what it's like to be a teenager in this kind of environment. Um, but also, you know, we can't deny we are still living in a world you know, where entertainment is constantly in our faces, you know, sexualization of women is constantly, and, and we, we, 
what we've done, I don't want to shame women for being sexy. I think women should be allowed to be sexy and be sensual and be sexually free. But we shouldn't just show that image all the time. Not all girls are like that. Not all women are like that. So we need to, again, representation is key in these kind of, you know, even in our, if we, if we go back to the media, that also, the media also plays a massive role in terms of why girls are feeling the way they're feeling about themselves. You know, I, I had to respond to a question recently about design a vagina. You know, in the UK, I think it's the number, number two surgery. <laughs> for women where they want to have labiaplasty and you know girls age of 14 you know under 16 are having it on the nhs and i said why is it why isn't there an intervention where girls maybe go to a therapist or maybe let's talk about she's, there's an issue around their body no no we were created and remember this capitalism is very con- much connected to this women really hating themselves and loathing themselves is a big business Surely it's not legal for a teenager, though, to have a labiaplasty unless... No, you can. You can. You can have it on the NHS. You don't even have to go to private. You just have to say you don't like your vagina. Yeah. But this is where it gets tricky. It's going to develop and change if you're 14. But, But if you're a black African girl, you can't have it because you're committing a crime. Imagine that for a second. That's literally the system in the UK. You can have labiaplasty if... In the UK, in, under the NHS, you can have, yep, you can have labiaplasty. Well, why? But my daughter can't have it because <laughs> she's why? a mummy. Because why? she comes under the FGM Act if my daughter has it. Oh. So it's not just a horrible policy, but it's also a racist policy that's in place. It's all It's really shocking. tricky, right? You don't want women, you don't want to tell women what to do with their bodies. But then in the same line, you can't. My daughter cannot. And a lot of African countries listed who are British, British girls whose families are from there, they cannot go and get, I, can't go, I cannot go to Harley Street to get my labiaplasty, but Laura can. Look, look, it's legal for, I will be arrested and the doctor will be arrested if I did it. That's the That's, system I keep coming back yeah. to. <laughs> but it's interesting because there's a, a huge pushback against trans people who experience body dysphoria, who want to change their bodies so that the outside of their bodies look more like the inside of their bodies. But Mm. nobody's talking about this. The Mm. same people campaigning against trans people who, you know, having uh, modifications to their body because of body dysphoria aren't campaigning against girls changing their labia because of body dysmorphia, presumably. Um, Mm. So I do think we need to look at what is going on there. But presumably, again, it's just porn. I honestly don't know and this makes me sound naive, I'm sure, I don't know what my labia looks like compared to other people's really. Like, a oh, bit. It's I've, brilliant online projects for that. Mm-hmm. What, to, to, I mean, it yeah. just looks it's to a, me like a good example of the genre. I've seen other women's. It's not that I haven't seen anyone else's. But I just, <laughs> it's not like... like do you I understand do, why? Is there, is there a part of you, I never looked, so I won't look, or are you, there's an anxiety around no, it? <laughs> no, I just think, I just don't really know what I'm looking for. I just think it mm. looks like a vulva. Like, I don't, I don't, yes, I have seen other women's vulvas, but I just, it's, it's not like I'm going to turn up. Like, I guess I do compare myself to other people in unhealthy mm. ways because, and I try not mm. to, because I was raised in a patriarchy and I walked past a lot of bus stops that had, Jennifer Aniston or Jennifer Lopez on them. And I'm thinking, oh, my hips should be smaller or whatever. And I try and get rid of those toxic Mm -hmm. ideas. But I just don't have a spectrum in my mind of like, this is what your labia should look like. I just don't have, I don't want that. I don't want it. I'm not going to go around comparing and contrasting. It's in, it's just seems to me to be a wild project. It's like my labia work Perfectly well. What? What? Why would I want to change them? It's one of the biggest businesses right now. You can just go to one of the. You can go to a spa to have your vagina tightened if you wanted to. Tightened. It's like a small procedure. Yeah. Maybe what the, the, mm-hmm. one of the fastest growing cosmetic procedures. Mm-hmm. Really mm-hmm. good literature that links it clearly to young people seeing online pornography, yep. in which women are extremely li- unlikely to have pubic hair. So you're seeing very clearly what's going on, and they are extremely likely to have um, unstereotypical, very small, very symmetrical, uh, very quote unquote neat vulvas, which young people then become distressed that theirs don't look like because what they're seeing in pornography isn't an 
accurate depiction of diversity. And you know, actually, we can't really talk about online pornography and the impact without also talking about within that the extent to which even the titles that you will see on those front pages massively uh, hyper exoticize uh, black women, dehumanize black mm-hmm. women in which they emphasize uh, hypersexualized stereotypes of, for example, submissive Asian women. Mm-hmm. And this stuff has such a massive real world impact. We hear from women writing into the Everyday Sexism Project, literally explaining the impact that that has had on their daily lives. A black woman who was in a job interview and the white woman who came out before her had a perfectly normal interview. She went in and the male manager who was interviewing her just out of the blue started talking about his fantasies of what he described as exotic black women and how he'd like to have sex with her. I think um, iteration in the shootings in Atlanta where the suspect uh, said that he was trying to take out temptation and was visiting massage parlors where Asian women worked. Uh, it, It has such an impact on women's lives, but we're just not really talking about it. And actually I think it's broader than online porn in itself. I think it's also about a context of internet literacy for young people, because it's not just that young people are seeing these images online and thinking, okay, that's what sex is. And that's what I'm expected to do. It's also that they are seeing those particular versions of sex in the context of an online world, which is also teaching them that white men are the real oppressed victims of today's society, um, that false rape allegations are rife and good men everywhere are losing their jobs. I was in a school very, very recently in the last couple of weeks and a boy in the front row who was 13 years old put his hand up at the end and said, what about all of these false rape allegations that are ruining men's lives? It's happening all the time. And he said it with such conviction. And I said, really, how do you know? And he said completely confidently, I saw it on TikTok. And that is, that's, it, it's all very connected. And it's such a massive landscape, I think, that whenever we talk about any one of these things in isolation, we're kind of missing the broader context, which is that young people's entire view of women, really, from social media and revenge pornography and what they're seeing in terms of online porn, but also what they're seeing in terms of online misinformation is having a massive impact in a really far-reaching way and we're just not really joining those dots. Laura, do you see an impact from the educational work you're doing in schools? What are the outcomes? So there's, again, both anecdotally and statistically, there's really, really good evidence that robust, extremely uh, high quality, age appropriate sex education has a massive positive impact. It um, reduces, for example, STIs and unwanted pregnancies. Um, In terms of the schools that I go into, when you go back to a school year on year, you know, a kind of box ticking one hour talk once and then we're done and dusted approach isn't necessarily beneficial. But if you see a school where they are taking a whole school approach where they're training teachers and they're talking to parents and they're involving young people in a conversation about what needs to change in the school culture and they're addressing things like the school dress code and what kind of sports kids play and they're letting young people start their own feminist societies and explore this stuff for themselves and they're doing peer mentoring and tackling it at a really systemic level the change is so dramatic there's one school in particular when I first went in the atmosphere was so toxic that when I walked out onto the stage to give the talk to about 400 kids, all the boys had prearranged in advance and they all started wolf whistling in unison when I stepped no. out. All yeah, of them together. Yeah, yeah. And when and was that? So this was probably about six years ago. And in the Q&A at the end, they were so hostile and the questions were so exclusively about women lying about rape and the gender pay gap being a myth that one member of staff, a female member of staff, stood up and told them that she was a victim of sexual assault and walked out of the room in tears. It was so toxic. And... I went in and talked to them. And then the next year, the school, to its credit, recognised that there was an issue. So the next year, we did teacher training and workshops with small groups of kids and a much more kind of informal, deep level. And then a group of very brave kids decided to start a feminist society. And some of their posters were ripped down. And there were only about five or six kids that came to the first meeting. And we persisted. And we started doing it different levels and crucially earlier. So I started talking to the younger kids at the ages of seven and eight years old 
old instead of much later on. And the next year I went back and there were 20 kids in the school FEMSOC. And yeah, there were some hostile questions and misinformation swirling around, but there were also a few kids asking what they could do to change things. And the first time I went to that school, not a single girl put her hand up or said anything in the Q&A. And when I went back the third year, there were girls saying, well, actually, this is my experience and feeling that they could talk about it. And it wasn't till the fifth or sixth year that I went back that it really felt like the atmosphere in that school had changed because mm. I saw it as a systems problem and not mm. a one-off. And mm. I just think the attitude... Well, well of- done you for going back because a lot of people, I think, after that experience would never have gone back. So you saw that as well. There really is a problem here. I'm really needed rather than I'm never going back there again. I was treated horribly, which is absolutely incredible. But also, Laura, it's not like the government doesn't know what they should be doing. They do. They know Laura exists. You know, for years, the the Department of Education had many opportunities and they still have to hire someone like Laura to really help them set the agenda on our school curriculums. It's there. She did it. So it's not like they don't know. They know. But again, if if you go back a little bit, dig deep a little bit, the reason there's so much resistance to what Laura's approach, to Laura's approach, it comes back to religion. I think we need to name that. I think religion's always, while we come back to, well, we can't teach this, we cannot have this, because, you know, it's against so-and-so's religion. I mean, look what happened in the U.S. recently. Like, women's bodies were literally fundamentally came back to a, people's religious belief. Mm-hmm. So there is that, too. It's not like they don't know what they should be doing. They know. They know who Laura is. You know what Laura's been, you know, Laura's been very, you, 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 you know, they know who you are, Laura. Like, and I've seen, I mean, sometimes I don't watch some of the comments on your page because it's so triggering because I, it, it's really difficult to read that, especially when, you, you know, we're allies and just seeing that, watching someone be subjected to that. And our government knows what, what needs to be done. The answer's already there. We don't need to come out with something new. But fundamentally, it comes back to religious people not wanting our education system to change because they need it to be a certain way so it fits into their narrative. I mean, I also know some religious people who work very hard at this kind of stuff as well to try and Mm. fight along with the good fight. I think Mm. there's a fundamentalism. And I also know some uh, not at all religious people who are uh, unbelievably uh, misogynistic and uh, callous about these things. Um, But I have no doubt now that we have a female prime minister that everything will be fixed within a very short period of time in Liz Liz we trust. She means to go on by abolishing the women part of Minister for Women and Equalities, which seems like a really positive start, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Reputational damage as well. (laughs) There are are teachers out there I know who are working their socks off and doing so well Mm. and working so hard on this. But there is this institutional... Uh, resistance. There was a video that went viral a few years ago of a group of boys on a bus in a university hockey team chanting about miscarriage and about assault. And it was a a racist, anti-Semitic chant as well. And some girls at that uni filmed it and put it on YouTube because they just wanted people to know what they were dealing with on a day-to-day basis. And the video went viral. And a while later, I was invited in to speak at the university by a very passionate and, and angry young female lecturer. And after I gave my talk, these three girls approached me and they said, listen, can you help us? And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, we were the ones that filmed that video and we put it on YouTube and we just wanted to start a conversation about the issue. But as far as we know, the boys in the hockey team haven't faced any kind of repercussions, any kind of punishment. Mm -hmm. But we are all, we have all three of us have been threatened with suspension for bringing the university into disrepute. Wow. That is the level of the situation that we're dealing with. That, that is truly would shocking. Rather brush it under the carpet for fear of being seen to have a problem than recognise that this problem is everywhere and that actually what would be proactive and positive would be to, to deal with it and to support young people who are inevitably dealing with it everywhere. That's truly shocking. So much of what you've both told me has shocked me today. Can we, as we have to wrap up very soon, can you tell me, something hopeful later <laughs> something you've got going on where you go here's a little bit of hope here's a little bit of positivity or here's a little bit of mm. uh, not not toxic i'm not asking for toxic optimism or toxic positivity no, no. but but i know that you're both doing incredible work and you have both made significant uh 
lasting change uh, to our society. So if you've got anything going on that's that we can either get involved in or that you feel hopeful about. Mm. Um, so I'm one thing I'm really excited about, it's being part of the team that's leading the global movement on ending FGM right now. This is in Africa. I think people have a, an assumption about Africa, which is a, you know, a dark place, it's, you know, it's horrible, but actually Kenya has one of the biggest feminist movement I've ever seen in my life. Like I'm really excited. I'm part of this uh, group of women and being in this space, I'm feeling safe. So Africa, you know, especially in Kenya, we've seen FGM is seen as a form of violence. They don't want to have the conversation about culture, religion or tradition. And this is violence against African girls. So I'm so happy that we're getting to that, we're framing it in that way. And one thing I'm very proud of, and I know change, you know, as, as much of the person that we've shared today, but I have a 20 year old daughter who didn't, she did face those things, but the way she dealt with it, the way she hasn't taken on board when men are sexualizing her, she puts them in their place very quickly. You know, they're the perpetrators and not me. So this sense of feeling, I can talk about this openly without being shamed. That absolutely gives me hope. And I think, I guess maybe deep down, that's all I want for girls, you know? <laughs> I absolutely agree with you, Leila. The way mm. when I see these Gen Zs and they have so much more confidence that I, yeah. that I have ever had. <laughs> and at, certainly at that age, they know so much. They've, they're autodidacts. Yeah. They've taught themselves. They teach others. Absolutely. They're whole in themselves. And it's impressive to see. Laura, anything that you feel hopeful about or that we could get involved in? Yeah, I think there is a fight back going on and it does give you hope. In fact, we know that around 300 new feminist societies have been set up at schools in the UK in just the last few years alone. Absolutely. Every week I'm going to schools where girls are coming and saying, can I ask you a few questions because I want to start a campaign. I want to set up a feminist society. When I was at school, I don't think I or my classmates knew what feminism meant. We are seeing... Mm generation of young women who are ironically portrayed as these wilting snowflakes who are actually the most courageous, brave people I, I've ever met, um, you know, exemplified by Soma Sara, who's recently got her book out about everyone's invited and her movement. We've got women like Shay Yakiwowo, whose new book about how to stay safe online is taking the fight to social media platforms to try and tackle the systemic side of online abuse. We've got Women for Refugee Women with a brilliant new campaign that everybody listens can support, which is about stopping new detention centres being set up for refugee women who've committed no crime and are often survivors of sexual violence. The Step mm. Up Migrant Women Coalition is running a brilliant campaign to persuade the government to make sure that migrant women aren't left behind when the Istanbul Convention is ratified. These are all current campaigns, along with brilliant organisations like the Centre for Women's Justice and Rights of Women who are running this campaign about statutory misogyny and policing. So any one of those, there are particular you can sign, there are donations that you can make. Those organizations are taking the fight to the system and we can all support them. This is this now. I'm feeling I'm feeling like I've heard the worst and I am I'm galvanized for the best. Um, <laughs> Laura, is there anywhere we can uh, follow you, books to buy, anything you'd like to tell us about or, or plug? Uh, yes, you can follow me at Everyday Sexism on Twitter or on Instagram under my own name. And my book, Fix the System, Not the Women, hopefully offers some positive solutions to some of what we've discussed today. Get involved. Laura Bates has got a bunch of books uh, that you can buy. And uh, certainly this latest one sounds absolutely incredible and like something we all need to read. Layla, anything to plug? Yeah, no, follow me at uh, Leila Hussein on Twitter and the, the Africa-led movement that I mentioned called the Girl Generation. We really want Africa, the African movement to really have big allies. So if you follow the at uh, the Girl Gen, so that'd be great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to the British Museum. If you didn't manage to catch the incredible Divine to the Demonic Feminine Power uh, exhibition, it was truly something. Uh, if you are listening to this in Australia, you will be able to see it in Canberra at the National Museum there. So, But keep make sure you follow the British Museum, sign up to their emails and see what else they're doing because they've always got incredible things going on. Thank you so much to the British Museum for having us and a huge round of applause for Laura Bates. Woo! And Dr. Leila Hussein. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. I've been Deborah Francis-White. Uh, you can follow me at The Guilty Feminist or at DF Dubs on Instagram or at Deborah FW or at Guilty Fem Pod on Twitter. 
There's 300 episodes or so of The Guilty Feminist for free, or you can buy my book. Um, please buy it from someone who pays their tax. Thank you so much. We've had a really wonderful time today. Uh, I've heard some things that have really shocked me and sobered me, but also some things that have inspired me and uh, evoked action in me. I hope you have too. Guilty Feminist.